Welcome everyone! Today we're going to explore Earthen Peak and talk to Lucatiel. Still on the road, are you? Sorry to have burdened you so. This is for you, by way of an apology. I found my thoughts growing hazy. My memories are fading, oldest first. The curse is doing its work upon me. I am frightened, terribly so. If everything should fade, what will be left of me? I had an older brother. We learned to fence together. He became the most decorated swordsman in all of Mira. I never even compared to him. In fact, I never beat him. Not once. But then, one day, he was gone. Lost without a trace. Now I'm certain that he was taken by the curse. Someone would hear my tale. My brother must have come here, too. Soon I may forget even about him. If only soon. Well, we heard her tale, and I doubt it will make her feel much better, but we'll do our best to remember her. Besides, there's still plenty of time left to find a cure or something. Is that a shard you hate to see? However, maybe we just need to find enough Estus class shards. It's really easy to get sick of the Emerald Herald. It's not really her fault. Now, before we get rolling today, I want to make a few purchases. I'm glad I want to keep this melon train rolling and buy some special equipment from him. As you progress through the game, you will start to sell the equipment of certain bosses. For instance, now that we've defeated the Lost Sinner, he sells some of her equipment. For a fairly high price, but this equipment tends to be pretty good in some way or another, so... Today I'm going to buy the mask and the cuffs. Thanks very much. Do come again. The cuffs have the curious property of boosting the power of pyromancy when you wear them. In addition to just being fairly strong glove items, it's a pretty powerful effect, so I think we'll put those on for a while. As usual, I go through my song and dance of deciding what to upgrade and what not. We're getting to the point in the game where upgrades actually start to matter quite a bit. If we started taking in unupgraded weapons into, say, Earthen Teak, then we would be punished pretty severely for it. They just wouldn't have the punch to get through most of the enemies there. Alright, so yeah, they look a little silly. A little. They're... see... less... I suppose that the developers just weren't willing to make an entirely different character model for when you have your hands cuffed. I can't say that I blame them. With that investment into strength, we are now capable of equipping the Dranglake Shield. The Dranglake Shield is probably 
the first shield that you will find with 100% physical reduction. That's pretty significant, so if you're specking into strength, it's something you really want to pick up early. However, for characters that don't spec into strength, it's kind of a hefty investment just to be able to use it. A useful item, if you have the stats for it. Certainly still effective, even though we're quite a bit farther into the game than when you first find it. That's the nice thing about a lot of weapons and armor in this game. Even if you find something early, there's a good chance it's still going to be good if you keep it upgraded. And in the case of shields and armor, you don't really even have to do that. Grim Reaper cosplay is over. Time to go back to the Belfry Sheik. Yeah, that looks like a pit. Good advice. So, Earthen Peak is basically a giant windmill that's sort of fashioned into a dungeon. A dungeon that is then invaded by dark spirits. There's more mannequins in here, and they have a nasty surprise. The variety with the small shields and daggers can throw poison knives at you. Even though we're mostly out of the sludge, poison is still a fairly important factor in this dungeon. Our invader appears, we exchange greetings, and I promptly get demolished. I don't know what this guy is wielding, it's some sort of great axe, and a single swipe took off half of our health bar. He also somehow managed to do a sort of jumping, plunging attack that just barely scraped the shield, and then Hal got stunned, and then the critical hit, and then it... Let's just start over. That didn't happen. With the life protection ring broken, I switch out to the ring of steel protection, which we got from Lucasheel. It's a pretty handy ring that reduces all incoming physical damage. It's not a huge margin, but it, it definitely helps. It's not really worth replacing another ring with if you really want it, but if you have an open slot and you just sort of want to make yourself more durable, it's definitely a good choice. Alright, now that we've made it more than a couple steps into the peak, we're confronted by our first trap. Some mannequin archers are waiting on that other walkway, and they will snipe at us as we deal with the big guy down at the end of the corridor. The best way to deal with this is to engage in some counter sniping. And then promptly learn the joys of bolt collision detection. Sniping around corners is incredibly frustrating, because in first person view it's basically impossible to tell if you're going to hit the hitbox or you're not. One for good measure. Alright, that's one down. The next one is a little bit easier because he's close enough that we can lock on. Locking on affords you about the same accuracy as zooming in, and quite a bit more mobility. However, even in this mode, corner hitboxes continue to be a pain.
with those two troublemakers out of the way, we can engage this guy. This guy is a Grave Warden. I'm not sure why a Grave Warden is here, but that's what he is. They're fairly durable. Barely. They use silver black spears, which deal a slight amount of dark damage, so blocking with the shield is not necessarily going to negate all of the damage they do to you, so it's better to dodge them. That can be a little difficult, though, because they have a lot of reach and their attacks come out pretty quickly. Except for that one shield bash that takes approximately 50 years to wind up. That one's pretty easy to dodge. The lever here controls the elevation of that poison vat. Those can be broken to spill poison everywhere. It's sort of pointless, but you can use it to your advantage against enemies in some situations. Now, this is a terrible situation for somebody using a great scythe. So I decide to switch to a secondary weapon, pyromancy. Much better. However, Pyromancy also has its shortcomings. Combustion is incredibly short range, unlike the Great Scythe, so while you will never bounce off the walls or get blocked or overshoot, agile enemies will probably just move slightly back and dodge it entirely. Not really the best situation, given that for Great Combustion you only have six charges. In that chest we find a pike. Pike is like a spear, however, it replaces the ordinary strong attack with something a bit different. Instead of simply a stronger stab, you actually take a running start and sort of charge the enemy. Now I would like to demo this more, but as I was saying earlier, using an unupgraded pike against the enemies in here would not really be conducive to doing much of anything of note. Mannequins do love surprising you. Now, something to note about the mannequins is that their combos don't actually come out very quickly. Once they start, they attack in fairly quick succession, but the first strike has a pretty significant wind-up to it. So if you just pay attention to that, you can simply backstep out of their combo, and then if you have a longer weapon, like a Great Scythe, you can punish them pretty severely for it. This one guards what appears to be the main windmill and a fog gate. Critical animation for the Great Scythe shield break is a little silly. It seems like you don't actually hit him with the bladed part at all, you just sort of jam the stick through his chest. Now, friends, I am going to pose to you a question. When you saw that big windmill, did it look flammable to you? Whether or not it did, the truth is, the windmill is flammable. This appears, at least to me, to be solid iron. Maybe it's coated with some really, really flammable oil. I don't know. Whatever the case, setting light to the windmill is a pretty important thing to do because it will make the upcoming boss fight much, much more manageable. It will also drain poison guck out of most places in this area, actually, even back down before the Covetous Demon.
Now, Earthen Peak is quite fond of traps. Not just enemy placements, but actual, like, pressure plates, oops, there's arrows, you're dead. Players of the first game might draw some parallels to Sen's Fortress, where it's sort of vertically inclined progression, and it's um, focus on environmental hazards. A little unsettling, but variety is the spice of life. The mannequin shield is pretty decent for a small shield. If you're going to use one, there are certainly worse choices. However, since it only has 85% physical reduction, for our purposes, let's stick with a Dranglek shield. When you're progressing through this area, it's not a bad idea to simply intentionally trigger traps once you find them. That way, if you return, you won't absentmindedly trigger them again. I have definitely been guilty of that while backtracking. I'll be thinking about something else entirely, and then, oops, I'm full of arrows. This switch raises and lowers that portcullis. Quite frankly, I do not know what purpose this serves. I guess if you're being chased by a horde of angry mannequins, then that can block the flow. I guess. Now, out on this ledge here is a new friend. Meet Gilligan. Shush. You idiot. Stay quiet. I'm on the run. Don't give me away. You're a fugitive too, eh? Yeah. Why else would you be here? It's got death written all over it. You want to climb down here? I can lend you a ladder. But, um... <laughs> how much can you offer me? Why, yep. I'm trying to help you, you know. Have you no gratitude? Downright rude, really. I, 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 I've, got, I've got a soft heart, so... I, I let you off. This once. All right. It'll be just a moment. 2,000 souls is a very reasonable offer. I'm not sure why a self-proclaimed fugitive is carrying around such a robust ladder with him, but I will not question him. Ah, go on ahead. I won't offer this deal twice. Down the newly placed ladder is a fairly valuable treasure. A Pharos's Lockstone and Twinkling Titanite. More than worth the 2,000 souls needed to get there. However, we're not done with this fellow just yet. He also has some things that I am a little interested in buying. Oh. What is it? What do you need now? Huh? Laddersmith Gilligan sells a variety of unsavory tools for unsavory people. As well as ladders, I guess. I'm gonna... gonna partake of some of this. I'm not, however, going to buy a ladder miniature for that price. What a weird guy. Instead, I'm going to buy more useful things, like the whip and a pair of claws. 
I briefly considered the Reinforced Club, but it's honestly pretty boring. So is the wooden shield, except for the nice lion pattern. Have you heard? Well, apparently, there's this monster lady, right? And the poison, well, does wonders for her body. You know, the health and beauty and that sort of stuff. And I thought only human women were so petty. That creature, she was human once, you know? Yeah. In fact, she was wed to the prince of that nearby castle. But her husband? Uh, he had feelings for another. The princess was desperate and sought eternal beauty. Hoping that it would restore the prince's uh, affection. <laughs> you see what I mean? Before long, the princess's ire transformed her into a monster. Now, listen here. When do you think this all happened? Long ago, when this very land was called something else. We say Dranglick now, but... countless kingdoms have risen and fallen on this very spot. And this won't be the last? Oh. That damned hag just can't let her old flame go. She's going to get us all burnt. God almighty. I'm not going to die in this dump. Fine then. All the best. Gillen. Gilligan has a great deal to say, actually. Some of it interesting, some of it somewhat vapid, and some of it downright confusing. This windmill is the only structure I've seen in this area for miles. I'm not sure what nearby castle he's referring to, unless he means the undead purgatory. Which, well interesting definition of castle. That switch controls this lift. If you hurry, you can get on top of it, access this chest, come over terrifying artillery fire, grab the mirror shield, and then run like hell. However, there is actually a treasure hidden beneath the elevator. The thorough are rewarded with the large soul of a proud knight and a divine blessing. The slow are rewarded with that and a crushing death at the hands of the wooden platform. You can't go back out the way you came, so don't panic. If you do, you'll just sort of run around for a little bit and not accomplish much of anything. Look for the ladder on the other side. Well, something just died. Maybe that will teach you to just fling around bombs willy-nilly. When I was playing this, the constant barrage of explosions was actually sort of rattling me. It was difficult to concentrate with the racket. Certainly I don't live near any cannons, but when noises are that loud, you can sort of forget. Grave Wardens are a type of enemy that can use Estus Flasks. This is something to keep in mind if you get into long, protracted battles with them like that. Now, of course, drinking a flask will leave them quite open. And they are not nearly as inclined as you are, necessarily as a player, to find a safe distance to chug a flask at. Da 
could sneak up on this guy and I... Oh, god damn it. The Great Scythe was starting to get a little low on its durability, so I decided to switch to the spear. In the Battle of Spears, we are a great deal more experienced. Now, this enemy across the way is a desert sorceress. Aside from sporting um, a significant lack of clothing, these sorceresses will shoot fire at you. Most of the time they will use that sort of split for fireball attack. Actually five, I think. They will also use an attack called Lingering Flame, which she just did. Lingering Flame will place a fireball at a fairly short distance in front of the caster that will linger for a while and then explode after a certain time elapses or somebody walks into it. It hurts a lot, so getting close to the sorceresses is a good way to kill them quickly because they're fragile, but it's also a good way to take a lot of fire damage in a hurry if you're not careful. I'm going to return to that particular leap later. There's still more to explore, and I'd rather not start all the way back at the bonfire. Once you successfully close the distance, they go down in one or two hits to just about anything, really. They're fairly resistant to magic and fire, though, so be careful of that if that's your main form of attack. This time I had a shield on me, so that trap which killed me last time did nothing this time except make me stagger and look a little silly. And goodness knows we never look silly. It might not look like it, but you can actually jump across the gap here. You sort of have to hug the wall and jam your face into it as you jump, but it's definitely possible. Light enemies tend to be stymied by the spear and shield combination. They don't tend to do enough stamina damage to actually break through your defense, even with you poking with the spear. Now, these pots also contain poison. However... <laughs> Unfortunately, we are incapable of aiming or locking onto pots, so we're forced to poke the damn thing with our spear and get muck all over our clothes. We have a pretty big surplus of poison mosses, so I'm just gonna go ahead and cleanse that. Behind these jars is a hidden door. We pick up a spell quartz ring plus one. I think this might be our first plus one ring. No, actually the steel protection ring we got earlier was plus one as well. Basically rings in this game tend to follow a system where ones that give you flat stat boosts tend to come in multiple varieties and the ones with the higher numbers are heavier but they give you more stats. Earthen Peak is a very interconnected area, so if you know where you're going, it doesn't take you long to get there. Stepping in the back. Oh. Why, it's mild-mannered Pate. We went through a lot together. Take this as a token of our friendship. Don't be shy. They were meant for you. <laughs> Well, we meet again. There's treasure this way, but I have a bad feeling about it. I don't quite have the guts myself. <laughs> well, I don't... Untwer untrustworthy he may be, Pate just gave us a king's ransom and free stuff, so he's okay in my book. 
if you did not summon him for the last giant fight, then he will not give you that. Once again, wearily looking at this jump and deciding, nah. This jump, however, is much more manageable. There don't appear to be any traps here. Our reward is this great heavy soil arrow spell. Opening up this door leads us right back to Pate, who we can then talk to and maybe give him the treasure. Well, good to see that you survived. Perhaps you're more rugged than I thought. In any case, the treasure is yours, since you went ahead and took the leap. I prefer a more cautious approach. It's hard to know who to even trust these days. For instance, I've heard that a man is out for my life. Now, what misunderstanding could have ever led to that? The poor bloke must have quite an imagination. <laughs> You be careful too, my friend, for trust can be a dangerous thing. You be careful. Well, Pate is pretty sporting about the treasure and lets us keep it. I would have gladly given it to him, it's not exactly a rare spell. Now, the stuff he gave us, Pate's spear is incredibly powerful, but it also requires a lot of dexterity to use, so that will have to be put on the back burner for a while. His armor, however... This is not his armor, this is the black leather armor that we got from Gilligan. His armor, however, we can use, and it's, it's pretty good. It's nothing really to write home about, but it has a certain nostalgic feeling to it, and it's pretty good for its weight. Earthen Keep is a pretty complicated area, so I got a little turned around there. Tate also gave us a great shield, but it requires a bunch more strength, and it doesn't even have a hundred physical reduction, so that's pretty much a clunker. Back past the hidden wall, a uh, hidden wall and hidden door in the wall, is the way to progress. It's guarded by two desert sorceresses in a fairly enclosed location. However, they are committing a fatal mistake. I am, however, just committing a stupid mistake. Well, I have learned since my last recording session that wooden bolts will not break pots, but iron bolts will. I recorded these mostly in succession, so instead I decide to just go with the old standby and toss a throwing knife. Doing so will break open the vase of poison goo and pretty quickly kill the sorceresses without you needing really to do anything. This is likely what killed the sorceress back in the other area that we had nothing to do with. Her attacks probably broke up in one of the vases she was standing next to, and the rest is history. Firestorm is a very powerful pyromancy, but... It's not effective very much against single targets, especially if you get unlucky. 
the pillar of flame placements are semi-random at least. However, if you're surrounded by a bunch of enemies, then that's a different story. Doesn't really matter if it's imprecise. If there's a bunch of guys around you, you're bound to hit some of them. That room sounds intensely pleasant. Much like aiming throwing knives. It doesn't seem to be a good way past, so I'm just gonna keep chucking the knives until I get through. Lock-on in this game can sometimes be more of a hindrance than a help. Now seems like a good time to demonstrate one of those dragon charms that the sorceresses have been dropping. These heal... I'm not gonna say all hit points, but they heal a lot of hit points and they also cure poison. The healing is over time, so using it in the middle of a fight, especially considering that it took a while to actually do the animation is not necessarily recommended. I might be a little too enamored with Firestorm. But they give us four uses. Be wary of monster. Wait a minute. That that chest looks a little different. Be wary of artisan. Most chests don't have that padlock on the front. This might be a trap. I'm going to fall back to my old standard of Indiana Jones trade book marks. <laughs> Trademark book. Thing! It's a mimic. It's a frickin' mimic. I knew it was a mimic. I threw a Lloyd's Talison at it. If you do that, it will just open up and surrender its goodies without a fight. You can tell that mimics are present, usually by um, the presence of bloodstains, signs from other players, and a slight difference in how the chest looks. Being made at least partially out of wood, mimics are very weak to fire. That lockstone contraption is not very useful at all. It creates a healing pool. And if you haven't burned the windmill, it creates a poison pool. Hello, friend. This dark spirit is tricky. His sickle will go through our shields much like Merciless Rowena's bone scythe did. He also has a great deal of health. He's also a cheater. Dark spirits cannot use S's flask. That is against the rules. Fighting him in that narrow hallway can be really difficult. I think that's a good that's a good point to take a break, collect ourselves. I'll talk to you guys later.